What is up, guys? I'm Celis Williams, aka the Swole Professor, here to educate you on health and social well being. Once again, here with my boy, Brendan Teets, aka Aesthetic Strength. What's up, guys? We're going to go over a lot with this guy's programming today. Yeah. We're going to kind of take you through his workout, right? So Yeah, so pretty much, guys, um, this is the start of a new meso cycle for me. You guys know that every time I start a new meso cycle, I like to take you through what I'm doing and explain the why behind what I'm doing. Um, so the first thing that I kind of want to touch on, guys, is mobility. You guys have seen what my usual upper and lower body mobility looks like, but as I am gradually getting stronger, <laughs> as I told you guys, my mobility is kind of having to change as far as what I'm doing based upon what kind of problems we're seeing arise with my form and technique and everything like yeah. that. So Brent, I'm going to go ahead and let you kind of explain kind of what you've changed with me as of right now as far as what we're focusing on in terms of mobility. Well, first off, let's splice in your clip of your fail squat. Yeah. Because I think that yeah. shows the problem right away. So Marcellus's problem is when he squats, his back rounds naturally. When he hits the hole, he's very kyphotic, especially in the erectors. Mm -hmm. So he has a butt wink, but it's it's pretty extreme compared to most people's. And if you look at the erectors on this dude, I mean, they're so <laughs> built and pronounced. Like his back does everything. And his glutes are really shut off. He's lacking what we call hip flexion mobility, basically, and I'll explain that in a second. But if you look at the squat, he basically descends down there. The first rep moves smooth. The second rep moved fast, but then all of a sudden his back kind of gave. And then the upper back gave, and the bar rolled on him. And then in the third rep, it was there's no way he was going to get it. And this happened under fatigue. Like right. Fatigue will exasperate your, your problems and movement. And, but the way I see this is long term, if he wants to squat 550, 600 pounds someday, then we got to fix this stuff now, but it's got to be very gradual. So the first thing we had him do is work on some hip flexion mobility along with um, external rotation. So we had him get into like a band around his knees and he'll put the clip over it. And we had him go into like a wall squat position where he's like laying down on the ground. And what he's doing is putting his feet into a figure four and trying to get his ass to touch the ground. Right now his hips are extremely tight. That posterior hip capsule where his upper outer glute is, is really tight. He's trying to get his butt to touch the floor. And if you look at this from the side, like if you pictured this from the way he's laying down, you'll see he's basically in a one-legged squat position with the one leg in external rotation and the other one in a squat position and he's trying to get his ass to touch the ground so he can be completely neutral. His problem is, is he tucks under and so when you're doing this, you felt like a ton of tension in your glute, right? Yeah, especially yeah. on the right side because that side seems to be a little bit tighter. Than yeah, the side. and you could see his ass was like up in the air. He couldn't actually get his back neutral in this position. So this was to uh, add some external rotation mobility and get his back a little bit more neutral. But now the thing about mobility is like you have to get it and then go stabilize it and strengthen it into a new position on the bar. Mm. So that was mobility drill number one. The second one we did was just his basic hip flexion one. Right. But again, this time instead of how you normally do it, we're really biasing a very neutral back. Mm. You're kind of bending over at the waist really extreme and trying to basically arch your, your back out because for you, when you arch, it's actually still usually pretty rounded. Yeah. And so we're just trying to get his back out of, of flexion. We're trying to get it flat and neutral in a deep hip flex position, which is what his problem is in the squat and deadlift. When he gets into that hip flex position, when his femurs get closer to, to his chest, his back get, uh, rounds over. And due to how I'm built, guys, like, and I've explained this before, I will probably never ever never. have a completely neutral back. And nope. like I've already explained to you guys, I'll even have like the description down below my video over lumbar flexion and why it's not as dangerous what people think to yeah. that exaggerated degree or extreme. But that's not an excuse for me to not get it as neutral as what I can. And that's what I'm really trying to focus and on. And we're not this. concerned about injury, really. Like, his erectors are going to protect his spine. Mm -hmm. the, what we're concerned about is more his potential. And, and the thing exactly. is, his glutes are basically really shut off in his squat and deadlift patterns. His erectors are, are extending everything. He's relying on the back to pick up the slack. And that's what we kind of want to fix. And then the final one we did was just basically a one-legged squat with the posterior band mm -hmm. traction on the bench. And he's just basically, again, trying to get into a squat position and get his back neutral. Now, I will say you got to do this gradually. We probably threw a little too much at him at once. Yeah. Because he started feeling very unstable in the whole of the squat. Yeah. And that's why if you do change this, especially if you've had years of powerlifting experience and you've built up strength and stability in this specific movement pattern, if you get yourself into a very extreme new movement pattern, it's going to feel very weird. So it's something you have to really ease into. But that's basically what we did for his, his squat preparation. And we're looking to change this over the next, like, I'm not even kidding, like, 20 to like 40 weeks like yeah. this is a slow gradual thing long term we don't want to just get him completely neutral back we could but we're going to risk injury doing that because he's not going to be able to hold up you know his 450 pound squat right. in this position he's never squatted in before and i think that's something people confuse is 
is strength is very position um, yeah. uh, dominant. So like if you strengthen a position and you get really good at that position, you're strong in that position. But if you go into something new that you've never done, even if it's a slight change, you're gonna yeah. feel very different. And a great example of that, guys, is just like I said, something as simple as switching your grip on bench press by one finger. Whenever we have switched my grip, it has literally taken me months for it to feel somewhat natural and somewhat strengthened. And yeah. the squat, as far as changing its position, is way more complex than just moving one finger. So it's definitely going to take me time to get used to it. But once again, we're always thinking long term as far as that. Yeah, and I mean, even just picture a gymnast like on the rings. They can hold themselves out, you know, in that, that cross position yeah. on the rings. Yeah. Dude, my pecs are definitely way stronger than any gymnast out there, but you put me on the rings like that, I'm probably going to tear a peg. Struggling. <laughs> yeah, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that very well because I'm not strong or stable in that position. So a gradual process. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk about the squat next? Yeah, so pretty much like you, like Brendan said, guys, you can see um, from the top set that I'm just, even for me, not moving quite as fast as what I like to. And you can see how I'm kind of struggling to stay stable in the bottom of the top set, which is why I think I stopped at like around, what, like three... 60 or 350. Like 350 something. Yeah, it'll be on screen, something like that. I pretty much just like pulled back a little bit because I did not want to risk injury in case I did over mobilize. And then um, with the back down sets, kept the back down sets true to like the what 72%? Yeah, and yet we said that. Um, all in all, I can say that it did feel a lot better. I felt a lot better in terms of like my positioning with everything. I felt a little bit more upright. I did feel a little bit more neutral in the back and I actually felt my glutes fire off like in a way I've never felt them fire off in the yeah. squats before. I actually, my glutes are pretty sore today, but because I'm still not used to like that type of stability in the hips, it just is something that's going to take me some time to get used to as far as that. Yeah. Sure. And he had sets of four pretty sub maximal mm -hmm. on this day, both on the top set and the back ups. We'll talk about what his plan is for this mesocycle in a second. So right. stay tuned for that. But after the squats, then you went on to your deadlifts. Yeah, and those felt actually like amazing. Those felt really, really good. Just because, like Brendan was saying, for the longest time, um, and this is despite, you know, the position I can get as far as my neutral back, but the glutes are just a huge part of the movement, both the um, – the squat and the deadlift, which yeah. is why we're always talking about everybody wants to do glute bridges to get their glutes bigger instead of doing deadlifts, which yeah. is going to definitely help you out as far as that. But because I actually felt a lot more activation in my glutes, which is why, you know, mobility is important, but also just pre-activation of muscles, I was just able to stay in position, maintain it a lot better. We're pretty much still sticking with singles on deadlifts, like what we've been doing before. On this day. On, yeah. this, on this specific day. But I'm now back in the belt, which feels really, really good. So I'm glad to give my belt back. <laughs> yeah, and this is probably the best his positions uh, look. So we were looking for just like a ton of fatigue from the last training block. We got that. Yeah. And we saw it manifest at the end of the training block. Yeah. This training block, we're actually looking to reduce fatigue and move into the peaking phase eventually. Uh, and we're going to talk about all that. So we had the squats and we had the deadlifts, all the yeah. singles, both your top set and like I think you had nine back Nine singles. back down singles on yep. the deadlifts. Yeah. And if you guys will see, and because I recorded both, like, from my first back down single all the way to my last one, just maintaining position felt so much better. And I know it was due to the fact that like my glutes were actually involved this time around. Yeah. So it and the deadlift is an easier one to fix too because the squat requires a ton of stability and you hit that very deep hip flexion position. The, the conventional deadlift, you put yourself into a perfect position right. and then initiate tension. There's no eccentric loading. There's no stability component. So for, for the deadlift, for him to change his position, it's a lot easier than the squat. Yeah. You're able to kind of achieve that in one day. Um, now, uh, I think for the accessory work, um, first off, I gave him kettlebell goblet squats, which I actually give this to almost all my clients in some form, but really specifically for him, it was actually to, uh, to tax the upper back and the core a yeah. ton. And I just want for him, for his like core and his upper back to get really worked because that's what gives when he squats. He gets that flexed over position. We lose force transfer to the bar. But I think really as you get stronger at this, you're going to start feeling it when you hold it in that rack position. Yeah. Your upper back feels so fucking taxed. Yeah. It even feels taxed on me and that's my strongest, I think, dominant position. Yeah. I have all my strength in my posterior chain. So I know if I feel it, you'll start feeling it as we get up there. Yeah. But more than anything, we're just having to move in that kettlebell goblet squat. Mm -hmm. And then what do we have after that? The side planks. Yeah, right? the side planks. Yeah, and that really hit my glutes like in a way like I've been doing side planks wrong my entire life everyone like, does it wrong yeah because this this it like especially like in the like in the glute meat area glute like meat, that, yeah. that that's where you're gonna feel fire when you do them right yeah so yeah. the reason why we chose those for him is because again uh the glute meat and minimus are, are like really the glute medius and minimus I should say are really misunderstood they both promote external rotation and internal rotation depending on what position your hips are in. So depending on if they're flexed or um, not flexed extended, 
uh, they're going to change function, but the glute med is the main um, functioning external rotator of the hips when we squat, along with actually the glute max. The glute max fibers run kind of diagonal, so they actually contribute to external rotation too, which is something a lot of people don't know. But what we're doing is most people, when they side plank, they think about their obliques. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. But what you have to do is actually think about your ass. And we're basically just trying to get him to squeeze his glute and push his hips as tall to the ceiling as possible. Mm. I did these two, and, and these are amazing, actually for carry over to the squat and so again kind of piggybacking off the DUP um, videos we're doing on, right. on the micro cycles we're choosing things that are going to help his movement here right. not so much muscular weak points right okay so like we're still training the muscle for sure but we're training it more with the thought of like okay how can this movement carry over to the squat right and so and and it's real minimal that's it I think that was the whole word yeah that right? was literally it like Four movements in total, and and fucking they're taxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah, yeah that. Dead tired. Try doing nine sets on deadlifts and see how that feels. Yeah. So pretty much, guys, as far as like the the main purpose with this entire block, I'm gonna go into more detail on this, showing you kind of each individual day as I always do when I get a new block. But we're still trying to you know gradually increase the volume because we still have yep. plenty of time to build. We're still trying to you know, gradually increase load, push the intensity, but we're actually keeping exertion pretty low this time around. You guys know that usually with programming, the way it'll go is maybe, for example, I'll have like, let's say on this day, um, three sets of four at RPE, like, or like a top set of four at RPE seven and three back down sets of four. Then the next week, it'll still be a top set of four, but at RPE eight, and then maybe eight and a half, RPE nine. This time around, we're actually keeping the RPEs pretty consistent on this yeah. day. And we're pretty much push, pushing the intensity by decreasing the reps each time. So this time around, it was a top set of four. Next week will be a top set of three, I believe. And then yeah. a top set of two, and then a single. So Marcellus is uh, 14 weeks out, I think, or Correct. just under 14 weeks out from his meet. So we had one training cycle of pretty good volume, and we got decently heavy at the end of it. Yeah. But I, to me, I don't like – there's singles are, are okay for improving fitness. Sure. But the real stimulus comes from volume. Right. So I wanted to get him back to volume while reducing fatigue because we got a ton of fatigue from the last block, yeah. but also still keep in some heavy singles. So what we did is ran uh, what I call fast progression where we move through volume and intensity very quickly in one training block. Mm -hmm. And we're going to kind of do this a lot. So on his top sets on his strength days, it's going to start off with week one uh, sets of four for the top set, mm -hmm. week two sets of three, week three sets of two, and the final week uh, sets of singles. Right. Um, and that's going to be for his top sets. His back off work though is always going to be volume uh, dominant right, right now because we are still 14 weeks out. Right. So we're getting in a lot of that. But just having that splice of doubles and singles in there towards yeah. the end of the block. And the cool thing is, is the RP is going to stay the same each week. We're going to keep it a static RP7. Yeah. So the fatigue will be a lot less. Likewise, on a secondary squat and deadlift day, we have them doing some high bar and some sumo. We'll go over that in another video. Right. But we're keeping our RPs really static there too. Mm -hmm. We start them up off on a higher rep range, I think at sevens, again for volume. And then we decrease by one rep each week, just like yeah. on the strength day. Same thing, static RP. And that one I think is RP6 all the way yeah. through. And that's something I want to definitely clarify to you guys because quite a few of you have mentioned that in the comments. There is a difference between increasing intensity and then increasing exertion. I thought we kind of made that clear in the last yeah. one we There's talked so about. Different. But they're completely different. So like you can have really low intensity, but exertion is extremely, be extremely high, high. And um, vice versa. Exactly. Because in this case, like the intensity will be going up because the objective load, the weight on the bar each it's week going is going to be going up. But the RPE, the amount of reps I have left in the tank is going to stay at seven. So the amount of exertion is staying consistent for the entire block on these specific days. And I really like doing this on pivot blocks. I can, well, everyone has a different definition of what that means. I'm not going to get into that. But the way I consider a pivot block is when you have like an awkward timeline, kind of like how we do, yeah. where it's like 14 weeks out. And we could still, you know, we could have peaked out your last one. They sure. gave you a quick eight-week block, mm -hmm. seven-week block, but I wasn't looking forward to that. I'd rather stay in some volume, mm -hmm. um, but also get in some heavier working sets on those top sets just to keep your fitness stimulation going. And then I also really like that the lower RP is being kind of static, even mm -hmm. though the intensity gets high because it allows that fitness to, to be promoted because the intensity goes up, but that exertion just keeps fatigue a lot lower. Right. The second you start hitting RP eights, especially like the way we have been programming, yeah. which I do a lot in the deeper off season, yeah. you hit RP eight earlier in the week and then later on in the week, you usually hit like an RP eight or nine two. Mm -hmm. And by that, the fatigue is just going through the roof. Right. And I think that's pretty much the main things I want to cover in this video, guys. What I really want you to take away from this is how Brendan is consistently adapting the programming 
to me. It's not always the same thing block after block after block. We're doing yeah. more than just changing out the accessory movements here and there, the variation. He's adjusting the volume, the exertion, everything based upon how I'm feeling. And this is going to be important to keep in mind understand when we do do our series where we actually go over fatigue, which will yeah. be coming out um, later this week. So be on the lookout for that. But that's pretty much it, man. Do you have anything else to say as far as the programming generally? Like I said, uh, what I will say is I think, I don't think a, a Maybe one out of ten programs. Yeah, I'll go through the training cycle with the original plan that I had in mind. Yeah, I almost sure. always have to adapt it in small ways for, sure. for the client, and I think that's something that you guys can learn a lot about, which we'll talk about in the fatigue series and then other uh, series going forward too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, not for sure. But all right, guys, that is it for the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and leave a comment down below. Let me know what you did. If you not leave a comment down below, let me know what I or Brittany can do to get better. Like the video, share, subscribe, keep it simple, specific, scientific. We'll catch y'all later. See you guys later.